Mental health. It's a subject on the tip of everyone's tongues at the moment, especially in the world of health and safety, and especially now given the current global pandemic we are all going through. So today with the HSC Network, we thought we'd take a look at the current ideas around mental health we have come across in our interviews with the experts. But what exactly is good mental health? Well, it is defined by the NHS as a positive state of mind when you're feeling safe and able to cope with a sense of connection with people, communities and the wider environment. This may sound simple, but with the lockdown and virus running rampage, it can be quite difficult to look after. And with more people now being asked to work from home, the impact of communication can have an even bigger impact on our ability to cope. Employers are now having to worry about their employees' mental health both within and outside the workplace. Absolutely, and it's adapting um, things for your environment. So there is no silver bullet. There's no one-size-fits-all strategy that's going to work for everybody. Mm. So it's looking at what you're able to do uh, and and what are the, the issues facing your, your employees? Mm. Because everybody's very much focused at the moment on mental health at work. Mm. Actually, it's the mental health of your employees full stop. Um, where, yes, they spend eight hours a day at work, but actually there's go, they go through a lot more at home. Mm. And unfortunately, it's the vast majority of the time, it's what's going on at home that comes into the workplace. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, you, you have to look after the whole employee, not just the work employee. The lockdown has blurred the boundaries between work and home. But as Gareth Mullen states, employers need to look after the mental health of workers at home and at work. This is already a challenging task, but lockdown has made it even harder. Not only has professional life become more difficult for many, more than two thirds of adults in the UK report feeling worried about the effect that COVID-19 is having on their lives. We are indeed all in the same scenario, as Sarah Brahma outlined in her talk. So this is our reality. For all of us in our businesses right now, every one of us and everyone in our teams, in our organisations are worried about our health, they're worried about our future, we're worried about our family, we're worried about our friends and neighbours. A number of us have got children at home that we're trying to keep under control and hilariously not only do one job, which is our day job, do another job, which is be a parent, and now here's a third coming your way, we've got to try and teach them something. We've also living with the reality that there'll be people in our business who are self-isolating or worse, suffering from and hopefully recovering from the symptoms of COVID-19. So this is the new reality in which we're all operating. And it is against this backdrop that we've got to be influential. It's against this backdrop that we've got to be persuasive. It's against this backdrop that we've got to get through to people. We've got to try and change the culture of our business. We've got to challenge our business. We've got to say no more often. We've got to engage our people and still deliver results. We've got to speak truth to power. Now, all of that would be hard enough to do if we didn't have a global health crisis to deal with. It's now just been made an awful lot harder. The other piece that I'm going to overlay in terms of complexity, if this wasn't difficult enough, is the reality that we've got to do it all at a distance. So I can't see you. I might not be able to easily hear you. In other words, we've got to be this extraordinary communicator, this amazing influencer at distance. Everyone now is doing exactly what we're doing, which is talking and communicating online. So if it wasn't already hard enough to communicate, we've really notched it up with the reality of COVID and the consequence of COVID when it comes to working at a distance. So the strategies I'm going to go through are ones which are practical and agile, but will enable you to cut through and make some difference. Because whatever your business in terms of your industry, and of course, whatever your speciality, HSC, Every single one of us who is looking at this now and listening to this now, the real business that you're in is in the business of communication and the business of influence. And it's never been harder. Some of the main issues many have found when working from home have centred around fatigue, social interaction and difficulty collaborating with colleagues. As Jason Anker states, we may all need some help over the next few months. I think it's so important, you know, we, we've been bogged down with this COVID thing for so long and I think it's even more crucial, you know, the similarities between my my accident, you know, we just quite recession in 1992 or in the recession and you know, my mindset was very similar to what people is today, you know, some people have had a, 
a great time during this lockdown. They've been furloughed and, you know, put on some sort of money, spent time with the families. A lot of people have been under pressure. People have been working through this crisis, you know, away from the families. Um, some people have had a good time through this crisis, but other people have been affected, you know, money problems, uh, fear of losing the jobs. Some people have unfortunately lost family members and yet we're all come back to work. You know, it's not one or two people needing some kind of help. This is probably everybody needs some kind of help. So, you know, I think it's critical that we actually do something proactive prior to this, whatever thing the crisis is going to be. So what can companies do to help? Well, a good starting point could simply be to ask the question, are your employees OK? You know, in terms of working from home, companies need to make arrangements in place to speak to their, their people that have been working from home on a regular basis and not just talking about work, asking just personal questions that, are you OK? Are you coping OK at home? And that can be a good starting point, but a holistic approach is needed. Many look to achieve this through the training of mental health first aiders, who act as the main point of contact for employees experiencing mental health related issues. We asked Gareth Mullen what Thames Water had done to implement this method. And it comes down to the culture that you have. You have to have that open culture, first of all. Otherwise, people won't come forward and, and talk. Um, so our mental health strategy was, it was entitled Time to Talk. Um, it's given people the opportunity um, not only to talk themselves, but to have people to talk to. Mm. So as a business, we have 500 plus mental health first aiders. Um, we aim for one in 10 employees being a mental health first aider. Uh, and we advertise the fact that we're mental health first aiders. Mm. So um, if I was in work garb today, I'd have my green mental health first aider lanyard on, okay. uh, which identifies the fact that I'm a mental health first aider. Um, and that. I have an obligation if somebody comes and stops me in the corridor for a chat, I have to stop. Yeah. Yeah, I'm there for that, that, that person there, first and foremost. Despite the obvious positives, mental health first aiders are not a silver bullet. And as Tim Marsh outlines, the need for a holistic strategy to truly help safeguard employees' well-being is needed. Do you know, uh, they can be very helpful in setting the tone. Um, you know, it's okay to be, not be okay, it's okay to talk. Um, they can be really useful at uh, uh, referring people to our health and specialist mm -hmm. advice, employment, uh, employee assistance programs and so on. But, you know, I mean, uh, a way of looking at it, and the, the criticism is, you know, if, if, I, if I work in a factory, you know, old Lambourne Steelworks, mm -hmm. where I come from, you've got hot metal flying everywhere, you've got forklift trucks bombing back and forth, you know, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, if, I, if I'm sending my kid to work in that factory and somebody says, but well, don't worry about all those risks, because we've got five really highly skilled first aiders out there. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to be reassured by that. And it's no. exactly the same now in, in, in work. If I'm putting huge amounts of psychological pressure on you, you know, because the tasks are, are too onerous, um, the demands are conflicting and, and, and vague, yeah. uh, there's no emotional intelligence in my frontline supervisors, mm. etc., etc. Mm. You know, all the stuff that can cause stress at work, mm. having mental health first aiders wandering around with sticking plasters isn't going to get us very far at all. I totally it's agree. got to be part of a holistic uh, and humanistic approach. Well, people have to take ownership for their own mental health. I think that's the most important thing, right? They, they, they do, and, uh, and organise it, but we all know what we need to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a person on the planet who doesn't know about good diet, about mm -hmm. good sleep, about mm -hmm. taking exercise, yeah. etc. Uh, mindful meditation. Mm -hmm. There isn't a person on the planet who doesn't know that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, what organisations can do is they can facilitate it by making it easy to do. Sure. Um, and encourage you know, it. Uh, and encourage it. I mean, and obviously you get the people who go to the gym anyway, get to go mm -hmm. to the gym for free. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, um, but well, you know, a, a lot of studies show that if, if there is a metric out there, if there are measures being taken that manage, senior management takes seriously, like mm -hmm. riding bikes, mm -hmm. people tend to ride bikes more. Yeah. You know, and, and you can facilitate it. So a very interesting study... Um, of why people rode bikes in London to work. Mm -hmm. The third reason was having somewhere safe and dry to store them. The second reason was um, that they had a place they could shower and get ready for work if it was, they were sweaty or wet. Sure. And the first reason was that management were interested in the scheme mm -hmm. and checked the scores. Yeah. It was ever this, wasn't it? You, you get what you yeah. demonstrate you really, really want. The sixth reason was that people thought it was good for their health. Mm. So, you know, there's a lot that organisations can do to set the scene and facilitate and encourage and nudge. So that's the end of today's video, guys. Thank you so much for watching, as always. And remember, if you want access to the full interviews with Tim, Gareth, Sarah and Jason, they'll be linked up in the description below.